As I've said before, what I've taught in the course can be used in a standard kiln, but uh, if you don't have an area for a standard kiln, a microwave kiln is a good introductory way to get into firing because it's so versatile. As you've seen, um, we can use it for all kinds of clay. You can use it for precious metal clay. I uh, did a course uh, last year in the uh, fired glass uh, course with a lot of other artists and I covered firing glass in a microwave kiln so you know that's possible you can fuse glass in a microwave kiln you can do decal firings there are, you know this little thing is just incredibly versatile and all you need is a dedicated microwave the microwave kiln and then some materials to work with anyway the last thing we're going to cover firing wise today or in this course in the bonus class number two is glass and specifically glass fused into clay this is a controversial technique i'm going to cover it because people want to do it even though uh many in the clay and in the glass uh communities frown on it but we're going to cover how to do it safely and what you need to do once you've got a piece that the glass is fused into the glazed clay so why is it controversial the issue comes in that glass has got what what is called a coefficient of expansion glazes also have a coefficient of expansion if the two coe's is it called shorthand do not match you get cracking you get splintering you even get pieces that shatter and it's hard to know if a glaze is going to be compatible with the glass you're using. There are many professional potters that do fuse glass into glazed pieces. But like I said, there are other people that say, no, 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 you can't, you shouldn't do that. It's dangerous, etc. I've done a year study and admittedly that's not long enough where I've had some pieces that I um, fused glass into the glaze and I've let them sit in the Texas heat and in freezing weather and thus far I haven't had any issues so the question comes up well then why is it um, controversial I don't know in six years if there's going to be a problem or not so my uh, take on it is if you want to do it do it safely and seal the piece afterwards. So these are three porcelain pieces that I have glazed and melted the glass into. They are cool looking pieces, no doubt about it. These are ones that I've done between one and a half and two years ago. So if we look at this one, this is a bowl. Okay, I'm just going to kind of rotate it so you can kind of see what it looks like. And I've glazed the back. This is porcelain that's been fired to cone five. Okay, don't worry about what that means. It just means it's a mid-fire. It's a hotter fire than uh, earthenware would be. So this is much higher than glass normally melts at. Okay, then we have this one which is also porcelain. I only used one glaze on this particular piece and it dribbled down the back. But you can, hopefully you can see, if I hold this in the right light, that the glass is cracked, okay? It's got all these little interesting shapes to it. It's sealed to the glaze but as it cools, the coefficient isn't the same as the glaze, so it, it crackles. At this stage, I've checked these rubbing a cotton swabber across it for any little tiny glass shards, and I've looked at that under a microscope. I haven't gotten any glass shards yet. That's not to say that I couldn't. These are demo pieces, which I will not be selling. The controversy comes in there well what if i die and somebody has a garage sale with my stuff somebody buys it and they don't know what they're buying 
you know, I don't have an answer for that other than eventually I will seal these and on the back I'll say not food safe. Um, you know, the argument there is, okay, well, they're not food safe. What if somebody rubs their finger across there? Again, I'm going to seal it. But, you know, there, there's always going to be an issue with this because some people just do not like the idea. And I get that because they've gotten cut doing it. And so they're leery of it. But there are people who want to do it. So I'm going to show you how to do it safely. This is the last piece. This piece was um, inspired by a geyser in uh, one of the national parks. There are geysers that have um, what are called thermophile bacteria. In other words, they love heat and they produce all these incredible colors. And so this was my take on one of those pools in that uh, park. And again, here's the back side. And in this particular piece, because I wanted all these weird colors, I used multiple different glazes and I glaze blended them and let them run into each other. So again, these I have not sealed yet because they're part of my ongoing study, but I have uh, a few other pieces I've done this way of, on that scale and I've sealed them and no problems. Now, the one of the issues if you decide to do a larger piece in a bigger kiln is don't overload your glass. And you may say, well, how much is too much? In a piece like this that's big and has a shallow bowl type shape, you know, you can pretty much fill the bowl. In a flat piece like a coaster, if you fill the bowl, the glass expands and then it contracts. And if it doesn't have any place to expand, like in this place, it can expand up the walls. It will shatter the sides of the coaster. And then you've got shards of glazed uh, pottery and glass in your kiln. I'm dealing with that particular problem because I forgot my own advice and I put too much glass in a coaster and it, it blew the sides off. So I'm currently cleaning up my mid-fire, high-fire kiln to get rid of the glass carefully that might be in the element grooves so that when I fire it, it doesn't melt to the elements and then I have to have somebody come out and repair that, put in new elements, clean it up, etc. So, you know, it's best to not have that problem to begin with. So we're going to pause for a moment and then I'm going to show you how to add glass to a couple of pieces that have had glaze applied to them but not fired. Okay, you put the, the glass on the raw glaze. So we'll be back. So I have my little microwave kiln here and I have two pieces that have raw glaze on them. This was bisque porcelain. Okay, so you can see the back, it's still white. And I've made a fairly deep depression in them. This particular piece we made in the uh, course, I think it was day one. And then this is a piece I made for the course as a demo piece. What I have here is some uh, glass frit. You can get frit in different COEs and different types of uh, grind, okay? You can get coarse, fit, or coarse frit that looks like little pebbles. Then you can get uh, medium, which is what this is. So you can see, hopefully you can just kind of see that medium frit is fairly small. Then you can get fine for it, and then you can get powder, okay? If you ever have the need to work with glass powder, so let's say you're doing a freeze and fuse in your uh, microwave kiln, you want to wear a uh, respirator or dust mask. The uh, glass uh, powder is basically like very, very, very fine sand. It's just very fine ground glass and it will get into the air and you don't want to be inhaling that. 
You can also use what I call found glass, okay? So this is glass that I bought from a manufacturer and it's got a specific coefficient of, ex of expansion. I've got this because I do uh, bigger pieces where I have to match my COEs and so I just happen to have some of this that I'm gonna use today. I do make my own frit and what you can do with that, you have to use the same bottle, if you're going to use a bottle, you cannot mix bottles even from brands, okay? So if you've got a uh, wine bottle from one manufacturer and you've got the exact same wine bottle from the same, exact same manufacturer, they may not be the same COE because they may have been made in different batches. So stick to one piece of glass, okay, if you don't know what the COE is. In this case, these are both COE 96. I've got some brown for it here and I've got the blue, I could mix those if I wanted to and I wouldn't have an issue. So if you break up a bottle, um, you want to use fairly small pieces in something like this, but not real, real fine pieces. You can actually use uh, what would be called coarse frit, uh, which are you know fairly decent sized pieces, but just don't overfill whatever it is you're firing. In a microwave kiln, I like to use the medium frit. It's just a little more manageable for a small piece. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do both of these. This one is finished with a parchment glaze. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use this mixture of amber glass and clear glass. I'm not going to overfill it because I don't want it cracking while I'm firing. So I've filled the bottom, but it's not crawling up the sides. And I lost a little bit while I was tipping it. <laughs> Remember this is glass. It does have sharp edges. So be careful if you spill it, you know, sweep up. If you do spill a bunch of it, you can, uh, you know, just clean out the worst or whatever got mixed in there and you can still use the glass, not a problem. Okay, and then this one, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take some of the turquoise. This one has got a bigger bottom and it's got walls, so I'm just going to put in enough to kind of cover the bottom. That may or may not be enough, but for the microwave kiln, you, the, you're better off using too little than too much. Okay, so kind of tip that a little bit so you can see how much I put in there and based on the height of the wall. Now, you can most probably see that the glaze, there's different colors. That's because I've put different glazes on here so that I will get sort of that um, blend that I had on some of those uh, bigger pieces I showed you. So now I'm just spreading my glass around a little bit more. I'm going to add just a touch more because I really don't think I've got quite enough in there. Like I said, I want to cover the bottom, but I won't, don't want it crawling up the sides. And obviously, the bigger the pieces, the more glass you're going to get when it melts. So with the finer stuff, it's not going to melt as uh, much because there's not as much to melt. Okay, so I've got the bottom not quite covered. And I'm just making sure none of it is on the walls because it's going to want to crawl up the walls as anyway as it melts. So I don't want to have it already started on the walls. And I'm just kind of pushing it towards the middle a little bit. It's okay if it's mounded a little bit in the middle because it will spread as it melts. This glass is not 
fine. It doesn't have any dust with it. I mean, if I dump the whole container out, there'd be dust in the bottom. But so I'm not concerned about working with it. But I do suggest, you know, wear, if you're not wearing glasses, wear eye protection so that if a piece pings up, you don't get hit in the eye with it. Okay. So there's nothing wet at this point. The glaze has been drying for several days and so now all that's left is to fire it. I have put a piece of fireable fusible paper in the bottom of the kiln. Now notice when we started this course my kiln was pretty much white on the bottom. Now it's got that kind of weird brown shade. That's from fusing the precious metal clay on the fireable paper. When you're fusing the precious metal clay, like in bonus one, it doesn't get hot enough to burn out all of the binders in this paper. So the paper ends up being sort of a, a maroonish brown color, and that's what that color is on the uh, kiln shelf. That will burn off the next time I fire to a high temperature. And the, the term high temperature is relative. I'm melting glass. That's low temperature theoretically, but it's still, you know, hot enough to melt glass. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to put this one in the middle. And I'm only going to fire them one at a time. Because I want this in the middle so that the heat's evenly distributed. And then I'm going to put the lid on. And then we're going to fire. I'm going to do my standard 12-minute firing at 100%. That's way hotter than the glass needs, but that will allow the glazes to thoroughly melt and to pool with the glass. Remember, the times that I'm talking about are relative to my microwave kiln, which is a thousand watts, and to my particular little microwave kiln. Microwaves will vary, microwave kilns will vary, even within manufacturers. So you have to work out the conditions for your kiln. Okay? So when we come back, we'll have the big reveal. Okay. So here they are out of the kiln and it worked. So the one, the long one would make a pendant you can see the, uh, the brown glass and the clear glass down there. I hadn't used brown glass before. You know, it's, it's pretty. It's just not really eye-popping. The uh, bigger piece over here, where I use the blue glass, it really looks like water in the bottom of this little uh, basin. So my plan for this piece is to take the little um, piece we threw on the mini wheel and glazed with the blue and put this on top of it and then make a little bird and put it all together and make a little bird bath. But I do like the way the uh, blue glass is interacting there. Looking at it, you can see there's uh, some uh, light areas. I most probably could have put more glass in this without any problem. But, uh, you know, I didn't want to overdo it and have a disaster. So, it works. I mean, it's a, it's a little pool of water in the bottom there. And it will make a cute little uh, miniature bird bath. And this piece, once I put a bezel on it, I'm sorry, once I put a finding on it, it will make a pretty pendant. Now, what I'm going to do is, when I'm done with this uh, class, I'm going to go ahead and seal these so that there's no possibility of the glass coming loose or uh, splintering. But that's how you can incorporate some glass frit into your ceramic pieces and fire it in a microwave kiln.